on this episode of Queer Sports. As big brands and big leagues capitalize on LGBTQ inclusion, are athletes sharing in the wealth? Breaking down the business of queer with Olympic figure skater Johnny Weir, soccer pro Zierra King, NHRA drag racer Travis Shoemake, and author Lindsay D'Arcangelo. The Recreational Sports League reclaiming dodgeball for queer folks. And LA's Angel City Football Club is reimagining how a team treats its players and community with co-founder and president Julie Ehrman. Welcome to Queer Sports. I'm Arielle Zimros, and we're talking about the business of queer. It's all about sports and money. First up, Pride Nights. It's when teams cover their stadiums in rainbows and players wear special uniforms that also often have rainbows on them. Before we dive in, just a little bit of history on Pride Nights. The first one happened in 2000 after two lesbians were escorted out of Dodger Stadium after kissing on the kiss cam. There was an uproar, and the Dodgers responded by putting on a special gay and lesbian night at Dodger Stadium. Now, nearly every pro sports team has some kind of Pride Night in America. And I'm wondering, are Pride Nights important? Lindsay, what do you think of them? I think they're important, but I also think it's gotten very performative. Mm. Um, very like, this is what we're supposed to do, and we're supposed to do it in June, and like then we'll kind of forget about it. It's almost like when social media during Pride Month, sports teams yeah. change their avatars to rainbow, whatever. But... There's no follow through. Just feels like it's just gotten very, like I said, performative. So Zero, what's your take on that? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think the bottom line is, if you're gonna have a Pride Night, you should have the things to follow up with the Pride Night. How are we supporting the community? How are we putting in practices, whether it be through the league or whether it be the club itself, to like not only show your fans that you're inclusive of, of who they are and how they present themselves, um, but the people on the team, like the, the players, how are the players supported? How is the front office staff supported? Um, how are we showing that we're not just front, frontward facing all about the rainbows and like really proving that we support the LGBTQ community? I feel like give me a pride night in December. That's how you can prove to me that you're actually behind mm. the community. I mean, I've been a part of a Pride Night for the Philadelphia 76ers, and I rang the bell, and I did my part, and I did my thing, because, you know, even if there isn't follow-through, I just feel that it is a, a, such a positive step forward for there to be representation by all so of these major teams. It can still be meaningful. It is meaningful if you choose to see it that way. It's all, mm. a, it's all about uh, the way that you see the world and the way that you see the way people respond to you. I mean, you can't expect everyone to understand your journey, but they can support you for a night and it means a lot. I right. mean, yes, there can be more done and there has to be more inclusion and you have to celebrate everyone for their differences. But at the same time, it is nice just to be recognized and to have that moment. And I think a lot of teams are waking up to that. Like they're realizing that it can't just be June, right? They're giving out LGBTQ youth collegiate scholarships or they're supporting LGBT nonprofits throughout the year so that that June event is really a culmination of their efforts and a celebration. Yeah. Um, I also think it you know, brings that representation to the next generation. So I had the opportunity to work with an LGBT youth organization in Arizona for about a decade, and we would take the youth to the sporting events for Pride Night, and it allowed those LGBTQ youth to feel comfortable at a sporting event amongst their peers, but at the same time allowed us to table and provide resources by meeting people kind of where they are mm. to that, that demographic that attends sporting events, that that kid who goes to the Diamondbacks game every year knows that that night of the year, he feels more at home at a sporting event because we're there too. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I feel like it gives people really an opportunity to feel comfortable, to feel welcomed, all of that. And also I realize that at the same time, you know, on average, these kinds of events, these pride nights, they increase attendance by 3.3%, which means that for these leagues, it is a money-making thing, right? Like, it is, it is something that, like, that night, they know they're going to bring in more people, they're going to buy more stuff. They're, so I guess, does that diminish their significance? We live in a capitalist society. Like, everyone's on the make. Everyone's trying to live their best life and do the best they can in business. So I feel like, uh, yes, there's money to be made off of the community. And, I mean, household names, famous designers, famous companies, whatever it may be, can uh, attribute a lot of their success to the community. But still, I think it's a positive sign as someone who grew up in the 90s and there was like no representation in sports right. on television to even have a night that's specifically for us. Again, yeah. it's just more, you know, 
picking and choosing when you celebrate, not just doing it because you're supposed to in June. Travis, there are Pride Nights in racing too, right? Can you tell us about them? Is this some sort of comedy bit you're doing? No, there's not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Did Johnny put you up to that line? No, there is definitely not Pride that Night in Mercy. Been a producer going yes. like, you know what? This will be great. Coke Travis. Right. Now NASCAR last year leaned into it. They had uh, like all sorts of advertising and branding, and they're supporting two drivers that are coming up through the ranks and highlighted them on social media, really to ruffle people's feathers. And I think NASCAR has led the way in motorsports, um, kind of behind Bubba Wallace and, and his his right. breaking down those right. barriers yep. and. You know, they really lean into it and didn't mind upsetting people. But I think that goes back to why it's important for the other major league sport teams to continue to push Pride Nights, is that we are such a long way away from having an NHRA drag racing Pride event. I rock an HRC logo on my car to kind of go under the rugs, and occasionally I use rainbow parachutes to upset people. Nice. But we aren't in a place yet in sports and in motorsports where it's we should be poo-pooing the concept of a Pride Night and, and the MLB because we're just lucky to have one or two drivers and a couple of fans um, in some of the world's largest motorsports. I mean, the fact that you're, the fact alone that you're saying, I use a, a rainbow parachute to upset people, like that is very telling, right? Like right. You're, you're trying to ruffle feathers. I guess I'm wondering like, what is that like for you? I feel like owning my privilege, right? I'm a, a, a tall white guy with a famous dead dad is the shortest way I put it. My dad was a race car driver. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a business acumen and know that there is a business side of, of sports, which is why we're here talking about it, yeah. and that this barrier needs to be broken down. And watching Bubba Wallace do it in NASCAR and be so financially successful, bringing brand new eyes to the sport. You know, the motorsports world is a $188 billion industry that's grown 90% in the last 10 years. Motorsports is on the rise, and it's bringing the re new people in to watch, that next generation, right? Gen Z, 20% of them are LGBTQ. They are watching the sport now, and I'm trying to break in so that they, my sport stays alive, that my dad's dad's sport stays around, and it's only gonna happen through representation, and so I'm up to the fight. I like that for every, you know, 100 people I get upset, I'm, I'm allowed to say piss off. The 100 people yes, I've pissed you can off, say it. You can say it. Piss that off. seven come up and say, you know, my lesbian daughter made us come to the race this week because you're here, and I think that makes it worth it. Let's switch gears just for a second here and talk about endorsements because that's where athletes can really make some money and, and sometimes even raise their profiles. Johnny, what has your experience with endorsements been? Well, first of all, figure skating is super niche for the most part. So there aren't the big Gatorade, Nike sponsorships. There might be small ones or little, little helpers here and there. But for the most part, there, there isn't a whole lot of sponsorship opportunity in my sport these days. Back in the day, the 90s, they had big business, everything was great. Most of my big jobs came after I was already a two-time Olympian. And I'm not one of those people to rest on being gay. I want to show a lot more about who I am, what I stand for, that kind of stuff. I never really sat back and thought, I'm not getting this because I'm gay, because there was nothing to get. Um, but after, you know, there were huge companies, like I was the face of Mac for an entire holiday season in every country around the world, except for a couple where you can't show nipples. You know, I, I've... I thought you said you were the face. I was the face, but my nipples were also... They were, okay. they were covered in glitter right. dust, and okay. there was a thing. Um, I think it was Dubai, maybe, oh, that yes, I couldn't yes, be in. Yes, yeah, that. but anyway, like, most of my success came after I was already successful in my sport. So, Travis, what's your perspective on this from, from the world of racing, right? Like, endorsements, how's that going for you? Not well, bitch. No, I'm, I know. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> A little Dorinda Medley throwback there. Um, endorsements are how racing is, right? Yeah. That's, the money is based on me. And yes. so I have a unique platform, which I, I've always looked at as an opportunity when I started this, is that mm -hmm. I have 20 million race car fans and 20 million LGBTQ spenders, and I'm going to just dabble in all these buckets because it yes. costs me about $3 million a year to race. I am solely responsible yeah. for that. And racing is like that across the board. You have to bring in your yep. money. Bubba it's, Wallace has to raise 30, raise $30 million to drive his NASCAR. Yeah. I have to raise three to drive my, my dragster. So endorsements are not like, oh, it's cute. I got some free tennis shoes and like, they're giving me a thousand bucks. Like, no, no, I'm gonna need a lot more than that. And the challenge I have found in the last two years is that you have these two bases that are very separate and that you may be very happy with how you're spending your money and, and marketing to both. Mm -hmm. And choosing to support me creates a negative crossover. An example I'll give is a tire sales store. I was in the fifth round meeting for a multi-year $8 million deal, and I was spitting out the stats that drag racing fans own three cars. Two of those cars have specialty tires on them, and the average racing fan, which there are 20 million, spend $1,800 a year on tires. By the way, 68% of, of them identify as conservative, and then slowly everyone leans back in their chair like, 
wait, so you're a bad business choice for us because you're telling us, people are already buying the tires. 68% of these tire buyers are going to be mad at us because we're on your car. So we see the gay dollar power, but now we're going to, if the waters aren't upset in the right. motorsports world, why would we choose you and ruffle the feathers? I think that's why we don't have more LGBTQ motorsports drivers is that our sport yeah. is, while physical and mental, you know, it's not something you can go do in a park on a Sunday. It's extremely expensive to get into. And I think that's where the representation barrier has lacked is that you need $3 million to make a name in motorsports. It's a double-edged sword, but I think once you, once I get the right side sharpened, it'll work out and that'll just open more doors for others. We'll be right back. A little more detail on the history of queer athlete endorsements. In 1981, Billie Jean King is outed and she automatically loses two million in sponsorships in 24 hours. Fast forward to today, and there's openly gay soccer player Megan Rapino, who's bringing in millions in endorsements. Lindsay, what's behind this change? Social evolution, and things have evolved. Um, both Johnny and I grew up in the 90s, and we had no one to look up to that was out, really, other than like a few celebrities here and there. I mean, Will and Grace was the only show that went there. Um, and just look how much has changed since then. Just even in TV with celebrities, musicians, actors, actresses being out. Um, and now you're seeing it, you know, in sports. And I mean, it's mind boggling to think that Billie Jean King had to deal with that. But because she dealt with that, Megan Rapino is raking it in. And then that'll just keep trickling down. I think it's just, to me, it's just interesting because clearly there's, there's a, a <laughs> different paces are being experienced across different sports, right? Like you have racing, which seems yeah. to be behind compared, but then in the NFL, there are barely any players who are out, right? Like, it, not everything is happening at the same pace. That's a good point. And, and you're seeing it more in women's leagues because throughout history, women's leagues have been the most progressive in, across the board, whether it comes to um, uh, acceptance of LGBTQ individuals, um, race relations, class relations, women's leagues have always been the trendsetter for that. But you're right, uh, men's leagues are still lagging behind. And let's say uh, an, an NFL player comes out, and I'm talking like a top starter mm -hmm. that everyone knows, like think Tom Brady, even though we know that's not happening. Um, hmm. But what would happen? <laughs> would, would he lose endorsements even though he's Tom Brady? I don't know, we have yet to see what that would even look like. But then the public pressure, I think now more than ever, would force that company to rethink that decision. Yes, right. So the public standing up for LGBT athletes, yeah. I think that, that's been a huge, wonderful evolutionary change in, across all sports. I think it's, you make an interesting point too about the difference between like the, the, the women's leagues versus the men's leagues. I think um, a big part of it too is like the men's leagues because of like when they started, like they have so many years on, on women's leagues um, that their sponsorships and like their fan base and like a lot of what they've been built on is not really in alignment with like, for example, a lot of things that are progressively changing right now. And so I think because of that, like you said, like they have to kind of play the fence of like, well, yeah, we want to support this and we want to support this because that makes us the most money. Yeah. As opposed to like the women's leagues, like coming in a lot later, like Really, and, and specifically the, the NWSL, which I, which I know the most about because I play in it, the players have built what they want the league to be. The players have de decided who they want the sponsorships to come from, like had kind of way in like where the league has built. So it's like going to be like a different mm. demographic of sponsorships or a different demographic of like fans or whatever because it's, it's just a different experience. Right. So this isn't true across the board in, you know, in every sport. Like, this can vary, but gay can be a selling point today in different parts of the country. For example, when a player like Carl Nassib from the NFL comes out, his jersey became a top seller within days. Do you think that gay can actually be trendy, right? Is that a selling point? Is that something that can help you help a company? My opinion is just partner with people that have a great vision, that work hard for everything that they've achieved and, and celebrate all of them, not just pick and choose gold medals or trophies or rings, whatever the case may be, but like really get behind an athlete, promote them and, and 
and just make them a person. I think that's what everyone is striving to be. I know that's kind of watercolor imagery, but it's my vibe. It's a big differentiator in my market. Now, I know moments ago I said it's why no one will give me any money, but in any town I go to, I'm on every morning show. They come out to the racetrack to interview me. Right There are 37, 37-year-old white guys. I'm at the tallest. I'm also the gayest, and I end up on every morning show. It's great brand awareness for a company. Right? Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. I'm the interesting piece of the story right. in drag racing at the moment. And the, the companies that see that value, they, they harness that and in a very authentic way. Right? They go do whatever you're going to do this weekend, which in Kansas was karaoke, and people came and watched me do karaoke with drag queens. Hmm. It's what I was going to do that night anyway. Um, and it just was a connection piece to who I really am, but that no other race car driver was doing that Thursday night before the race. Um, and I think that that's, that's where, it, yes, it is a positive, is that yeah. nine times out of 10, I'll get picked for the morning show interview because I'm, wait, what? I'm a new piece of the drag racing storyline that they see every year when the race comes to town. So if these sort of more conventional companies aren't sponsoring you, do you stand a better chance with a company like Grindr? Which is one of my corporate partners. I, okay. And Grinder stepped up to the plate. Last year, all of my racing equipment was stolen from the pits. $8,000 worth of my helmet, my fire suit, everything I have to wear. Mm-hmm. I had brought Grinder to the race to sell them the concept. They appreciate me as an athlete and wanted to make sure I had the proper safety equipment. Grinder is not in a position to give $3.2 million to me to sponsor me, nor should they. They should give that to the Grinder Foundation and be spending that in a different way. But I'm certainly not in a position to reject money from a company like Grinder. And I have had conversations with other sponsors that are now not apt to sponsor me because I have all these wonderful headshots in my Grinder fire suit. So oh my it, God, that's so complicated. So right. So it was an eight thousand dollar deal just so I didn't have to race naked. And now people are like, we don't want to do business with you because you have the grinder suit on. But yes, just to go back, you know, spending, finding the money within the family is is a great model, um, and it's proven successful once so far in two years. And I love my grinder fire suit. I didn't ask you about endorsements. How's that going for you? So I have a sponsorship with Adidas, which um, I feel I feel lucky because. Like their call from them, like when they when they asked to come sponsor me, they said like we really like who you are, we like your message, we like how you present yourself to the world, and that's why we want to sponsor you. Like mm. it wasn't because you're really good at soccer, or because you're this, or because you're that. It's because like we see what you're doing and how you're showing up, and we want to get behind that. And so I think that that's something that I, I've, I'm fortunate that Adidas, you know, sees that and wants that in the athletes that they represent. And so I think that. Um, for me, like, I feel fortunate, and I think that it's hard for me to speak on behalf of everyone, but, and I, I would never want to do that, but I feel really, really lucky. I think what I'm hearing from you and what I'm hearing from you, the way that I'm putting it together in my mind is, is, right, it's not that you're gay. It's that you have this story that then becomes relatable. You have this thing that you can talk about, this journey that you went through. And I do think that in some ways, being queer, whether it's trans or gay or what have you, it gives you a story to tell that is and can be really inspiring. And in that respect, I do think that we could boil it down to saying that gay is trendy, but that's actually not the thing, right? Is that your story is compelling. Ultimately, I think that's what the appeal of Carl Nassib was. Um, It wasn't just that he came out, it was his story. and, And that having to carry that weight for so many years and playing in the NFL, which we all know, like that that's the epitome of the, the men's leagues as far as having a, a gay athlete come out. That's like a huge barrier. It has been for eons. And so to see him be able to do that, you just want to root for somebody like that. Yeah. You want to support him. You want to cheer them on. You want to give him a hug. It's a beautiful thing. And as human beings, we, we resonate with that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, I think trendy is just like not the right word. You no, know? it's like, not. I they think like totally a trend like kind of comes and goes. And like, I think like this is something that's been happening and something that will continue to happen as change happens. And as we continue to um, break down barriers and allow people to be authentic to themselves, the authenticity piece of it, it's like, that's what we want. And it's someone who's like, okay, like you, like you said, you have a story, you have a message, you have something that people are, are gonna get behind or that people want to hear or that people want to understand more. And so I think that that's really what it is versus like a trend. Yeah. Do you ever feel any pressure as a black woman, as a gay woman to to be a certain way, to present a certain way, even from a gender standpoint? I mean, I think 
it's inevitable go, going through this world. You have to show up in, in different ways. And it comes from like being in so many different rooms, like being in a predominantly white sport. You have to like just kind of adapt. Adaptability is really important. It's a part of how you show up in this world. And I wish it didn't have to be that way, but I think that, you know, sometimes it is what it is, you know. Coming up, I sit down with the co-founder and president of the Angel City Football Club, entrepreneur Julie Ehrman. I'm sitting across from Julie Ehrman, a former entertainment executive turned soccer club co-founder. Alongside Natalie Portman and Kara Nortman, Julie built a brand new women's professional soccer team, the Angel City Football Club. Thank you so much for joining us. Angel City Football Club, there's a really interesting origin story for it, right? So can you tell me that story? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what's most interesting is it was started by three female founders, which I don't think is common in any sports story. It was founded by Natalie Portman, the actress and activist, Kara Nortman, who's a venture capitalist, and myself, an entrepreneur. And it really started out of Natalie and Kara's work with Time's Up. The national team was about to embark on their lawsuit against U.S. soccer for pay equity, which we just celebrated, the signing of their CBA and pay equity with the men. So it is an incredible full circle that they got what they deserved. But at the time, Natalie and Kara were spending a lot of time with the women, learning about their story and trying to understand why them being more successful than the men, getting greater viewership than the men, even selling greater merch than the men, resulted in less money. Right, And so they wanted to affect change. It started with Natalie attending a friendly match with USA and Belgium in the Bank of California in 2019. She brought her friends to the game, which just happened to be Eva Longoria, Jessica Chastain, Jennifer Garner, Uzo just Duba. Happened just be. happened to be, you know, sure. her, her buddies. Also <laughs> Angel City owners, so that's, that's, a, that's an um, amazing benefit. But they all wore t-shirts that said, time's up, pay up. And that got a significant amount of attention. Um, and I think that stuck with Natalie. The second sort of impetus for Angel City was Natalie watching Abby Wambach accept the Icon Award at the ESPYs. And she received it at the same time as Peyton Manning and Kobe Bryant, who were going on to greatness, had hundreds of millions of dollars, their future was laid out in front of them. And Abby talked about the fact that she didn't know what a mortgage was and she didn't know how to pay for her, for her rent. Karen and I have known each other in LA for 20 plus years. We've both grown up here. We played basketball against each other. And there was a Monday night where we both um, play in this wild feminist women who tech basketball league, which sounds way more impressive than it is. It's like three on three and a lot of like wine drinking. I mean, that sounds like fun to me, but it, all it's, right. It's super fun. But that night, Kara came and told us all about the World Cup and got us all excited. And when it was over, she pulled me aside and said, Natalie and I have this crazy idea to bring a women's professional soccer team to LA. Can you help us figure out what that would look like and if it makes sense to be a part of it? That was a Monday night. That following Sunday, Kara, Natalie, and Becca and I went to a game at LAFC, it happened to be the El Trafico, which is LAFC against the Galaxy. Sold out crowd in this incredible stadium. My first soccer match ever live. Wow. Um, was so enamored and sort of transformed by the 3252, which is their supporter group. We just looked at ourselves and we said, we need to do this for women. And that, that was the beginning. And so there really was an appetite for this. There was definitely an appetite. I mean, LA is one of those challenging markets, right? Where it has all the benefits that you'd ever want to bring a professional soccer team, but also all of the negatives, right? There are nine professional sports teams in LA, including right. USC and UCLA. It's a lot of competition for fans. Oh my God. Like they're all champions in their own right. And if you're not competing for sports, you're competing with the beach and you're competing with the mountains, right? And you're competing, competing with the amphitheaters and you're competing with the theaters. And so you have like all the great ingredients, but you also have, if you're not a winning team, if you don't build a compelling experience, um, if you don't build a reason for people to want to come and see you versus something else, you're not going to be successful. Right. From what I understand, you have the largest women-led ownership group in professional sports. Is that correct? It is. We're female-run, female-founded, female-invested sports team. We have investors that span entertainment, that span sports, that span business. That includes all the women in the photo from that friendly match. So Eva, Jessica Chastain, Jennifer Gardner, Uzo, America Farrar, but we also have Sophia Bush and we have Lily Singh. We Christina have Aguilera, I Christine think. Christine Aguilera. We have the GOAT herself, Billie Jean King, um, and Lindsey Vaughn. And then we have 14 former U.S. women's national team players led by Abby Wambach and Julie Foudy and Mia Hamm. It's pretty incredible. And their investment is so important because we wouldn't exist if not for their success and for how, how hard they worked 
to fight for women's soccer, to fight for it to be an Olympic sport, to fight for the attention, to fight for the fans. And so to be able to not only give them a voice in the future, but also a financial stake in the future is something that is absolutely incredible and something they never thought they'd have the opportunity to have. But I would be remiss without saying that one of the reasons that Natalie and Karen and I were able to pull this off is because we were able to bring Alexis Ohanian into the fold, who's our controlling owner. Alexis is the Serena Reddit Williams' founder. husband. Right, and the Reddit founder. And when we pitched him the idea of Angel City, he understood how we wanted to build the platform, how we cared about impact and revenue, and how we believe that through fandom changing, where fans follow players first, teams second, and leagues third, we have the ability to tell stories around these players, this team, this community, and really drive the sport. I'm really wondering what happens then, right? When you have these amazing minds who are able to come together, who are backing this project, how is it different from, from any other soccer club? The first slide of our presentation investment deck was, this is bigger than the game. We knew that we had the opportunity and the platform to not only grow women's sports, but ultimately drive to equity, which is what we care about. We want to give these players pay equity. We want viewership equity. We want sponsorship equity, right? We want the equity as relates to attention of fans. So we knew that if we could build something substantive um, and build it loudly, that we had the opportunity to ultimately drive to equity. So the idea of Angel City really was to be a global brand because if we're a global brand, we can garner the most attention and awareness, which can drive impact and drive revenue. It's just bigger, right? It's just bigger than you know 11 players on the pitch. In terms of how this impacts the players, right? We're talking about pay equity. How is Angel City better than any other team for them? Uh, so it's a couple of reasons. Um, one is this concept of shared values. So we wanna have a positive impact in the community. So everything we do at Angel City directly impacts the community. And we do that in one very sort of simple way where we say that 10% of our sponsorship dollars goes back into the community. This year was over a million dollars of impact back in the community. The second way is, again, our purpose is to set higher expectations on and off the pitch. I want, an Angel City wants to bring more players back to the sport. And so we launched something called the Player 22 Fund with the California Community Fund, which is a grant system for former players to be able to um, enhance their education to stay in the sport. So maybe they want to become a broadcaster or a lawyer or they want my job. So we raised $100,000 and former wow. players will be able to apply and be able to get their coaching license or the ref license or whatever it is they want. That's huge. Um, so you're basically, yeah. it's like a post-career plan for them. You want to help them out and develop them in other ways beyond the sport. They're truly some of the most successful athletes I've ever seen in my generation. They are incredible human beings. They are so incredibly successful. And so the fact that they do not receive the same accolades, the same financial support, the same retirement benefits as their male counterparts is just ridiculous. When you look at the NWSL, when you look at the future of that league, what comes to mind? There is no ceiling as it relates to how big this can get. Yeah. And the success of the U.S. women's national team for decades now mm -hmm. has created these players that are bigger than, bigger than sports, right? They're cultural icons. You know who they are. So now if I can just make sure that you know where they're playing, when they're playing, I have such a better chance of getting you to show up when our games are on broadcast. We crush it. So our championship game, which was Portland Thorns against Kansas City Current, CBS primetime, 915,000 viewers. The previous year MLS final, 1.1 million. Mm. Just give us the stage and people will show up. Mm. Women's sports fans are the hardest working sports fans in sports. And if you show that you care, they're gonna show up too. Julie, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me and for telling the Angel City story. I expect a, a really good 2023. Femininity sells, right? If you're a feminine presenting female athlete, that's gonna get used by brands. Zira, you know, are queer athletes who don't fit into traditional gender norms, are they getting attention from brands? I hope we continue to see it shift and change. I think it's starting to. I think a lot of people are starting to put pressure on companies and realize and say like, the representation is not, it's not equivalent across the board. Again, it's the, it's the marketing side of things. It's the, it's this idea of like, the straight, blonde hair, blue eyes, like this is what people want. This is what the market audience is. And I think that not only have like people started to show that actually this isn't what the market is, but yeah. like that 
it can be like a, a representation of what this country or like what the demographic of people that support your brand actually look like. And so I think that we've seen in the past that it definitely has not been the case. And I think we're starting to see the tables kind of turn um, and hopefully it will continue to turn. But I think again, it's like such an interesting thing of like, is it because they're not feminine? Is it because they're black? Is it because they're queer? Is it because they're like, there's so many things that we could say, is it because of all these things? And I think that's like a good blanket for companies to be like, well, you actually don't really know why we're not sponsoring you. And athletes speaking out about it too, like a good example of that is John Quill Jones, WNBA, Connecticut Sun, tweeted out about the lack of endorsements. She was MVP a year ago and the lack of endorsements that she was receiving. And she said, is it because, is it, you know, I'm, I'm a tall, queer, black woman who's more on the masculine side. Is this, is this playing a role? Like how, it, in other words, how is it, it's pretty obvious that that's a factor. And yes. um, her saying that started up a whole conversation about it. And she's got an endorsement with State Farm. You see her in a State Farm commercial with a couple of her, uh, NBA players. And it's a, it's a hilarious commercial. It's great. But it's awesome. And I feel like it's because she put herself out there to say, to question the status quo, pretty much. And you look and you see which female athletes have, are the most, have the most endorsements. And Sue Bird and Megan Rapinoe are good examples of that. And yes, they're gay, but they're also, they have a certain look to them. And I think... To that point, too, I think because there's still a demographic of people that undervalue women's sports, which the narrative is changing, so get on board, but that's beside the point, that undervalue women's sports to say, like, oh, it's just not as exciting, it's not as this, it's not as that. It's like, I feel like people are always trying to, like, sexualize it because yeah. then it's like, well, it's historically, like, women are just sexualized. And it's, it's always, that's always, like, the thought process. It's, and it's like, it doesn't have to be that way. Like, number one, we're talented. Number two, we belong. There is value in what we do. And that does not have to be the first avenue that people take when, yeah. when thinking about sponsorships or, or marketing. Absolutely. I come from a sport that is female-driven. Right. And a sport that celebrates all things woman. So when you think of figure skating, generally you'll think of a woman in a beautiful dress, uh, skating to pretty music and holding flowers, and that's what most people think of when they think of a figure skater. And that, in my sport, is generally more valuable than a man, and any kind of man. Mm -hmm. um, being a woman is, is far more valued for that. They get the commercials, they get the endorsements, they get the, everyone knows who she is before the Olympics. And um, I think that that definitely comes from people thinking in a very old conservative way about who they think the public is going to like. Ultimately, it gets, the decision is made not necessarily based on your gifts or your talents, but your personality, what you bring to the table, and the way you look. And if you fit the mold of what most people think your sport is. Oh, it's so interesting to hear that perspective, because I feel like we speak about like women's sports like generally, and then like men's sports are this, but like I feel like in figure skating, it's like yeah. a different dynamic. So thanks for sharing that. No, thank you. Thanks to social media, players now have the ability to have these direct relationships with their fans. So they're building you know, following and they're building their personal brands. How does that affect you, right? To be able to interact with your figure skating fans. One thing that I've seen outside looking in is that the sports arena is a lot kinder among the athletes. Okay. Uh, when I was competing, I wouldn't know what kind of shape my rivals were in, what mm. music they were skating to, until I showed up at a competition and had to see them on practice. Now, everyone is kind of invested in each other's lives. There's a friendliness, there's more of a camaraderie, and an individual sport is very backstabby, few opportunities. You grab them when you right. have uh, the opportunity. If you're looking for warm fuzzies and fairness, it's not to be found in Olympic sports. Um, you know, that's just the mentality that I grew up with. I think that there is a huge benefit to getting news out there before somebody else does. Like if I've got a story or something that I need to say, I trust myself to tell that story a lot more than I would trust somebody else to mm -hmm. run that story. Sure. And I think for me as an aged figure skater <laughs> turned commentator, um, I like that ability to talk directly and not have to rely on someone else. Travis, what's it like for you to be able to interact with your fans? Well, as I definitely have the least followers here because when I say 
drag racing, instantly everyone thinks RuPaul. So we're still making a name for the world's oldest motorsport. Um, <laughs> and so I have the, the privilege of creating my brand because I'm kind of off the radar as, as being authentic and being myself. But also there is that you get the directive of, hey, if you want to make it farther, you should post most of this, more of this content. Or anytime someone pulls a photo of me from Instagram, it's shirtless from six years ago when there were abs around. And that is what, what is the, the photo that is always chosen. Sure. And that I should be producing more of that content. But that's not, now I'm like a write Christmas songs for my mom at home on the piano poster. And that doesn't fall in line with what people want as, as, mm. this, as the fan following. Thirst traps. The, the thirst tra- <laughs> I've been directed to be a little more thirsty. Um, and I'd rather just, you know, if I'm sponsored by a gas station, doing funny bits, pumping people's gas. And like, cute, and can you pump that gas shirtless? <laughs> I, so it's balancing, right, who, who I want to be. And also, yeah. and I, I have, again, as we previously mentioned, I'm at a position where I'm not above selling out. But is that really what I want my brand to have been when I look back at how I started, you know, my, my racing career? And so I think that's, that's the juggle, is that here's who I am authentically. Here's who I know who you'd like me to be. I can give you a little bit of that, but I'm not going to take a directive to pump gas shirtless for a check, um, unless it's the right check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next up, what started as a pickup game is now the biggest queer sports business in North America. We're going inside Out Loud Sports. Welcome back. We sat down with Will Hackner, the CEO and founder of Out Loud Sports, and learned about how his desire to find an alternative to the bar scene led him to build the largest queer sports business in North America. Take a look. For me, playing is everything. Relaxing into an activity that's fun that gets those endorphins up, that brings a joie de vivre to yourself, to, that, that just allows you to be something more than what society has deemed you to be. I Love Sports is a lot of passion from a lot of people. We created the first queer sports organization in the world, a recreational sports group of just fun games. That's really the idea for anyone of any skill set, whether you have grown up playing sports or you're a Division I athlete, or you were like me, who was a tiny, bullied little mess of a kid who would rather have been playing video games than actually like trying to throw a ball, which I could not throw a ball <laughs> for quite some time. You know, I just came in to have a good time. Literally, I didn't know anyone on the team except maybe two or three people, so I just added 20 people to the friend group. When I was little, I, I would be scared of the ball, like, oh, baseball or whatever, basketball. If it was like a kind of like a physical one, I'd be scared. So this is fun. It's kind of like, oh, I didn't know I can throw a ball or, you know, like I didn't know I had this in me. We've been able to program in 22 cities around America. We've been able to create the first national queer kickball tournaments. It is constantly evolving. I changed my grinder profile to jock, because <laughs> even though I'm not, but I was just like, I play sports, so I consider myself a jock now. <laughs> now we've been recognized across America in press and media and so forth, and that's really cool. But honestly, the best thing that we've ever done is build queer spaces where they didn't exist before, that have now become safe places for people of a similar interest and vibe to be able to come together and just enjoy the safety and the fun that we can have with each other without politics, without prejudice, without anything. Just let's just chill out for a moment. 50 minutes a week, come play a game, let's have some fun. Awesome. Ready, ready. Sports are physical. Sports are masculine. Sports are, in many ways, toxically masculine. I didn't connect with that world, and I always felt ostracized from that world. You know, I think back to kickball in gym class. All the kids who would hit me, knock me down, punch me in the face. I mean, incessantly bullied. And the last gym class I ever took was my freshman year of high school. Kid trips me, knocks me over, I break my wrist. I didn't step on or play a single sport, really, until 2004. As a gay kid, when you're playing a sport with predominantly, if not completely straight people, that there's that always us versus them mentality. And I think that's a lot of queer people in sports today. It's like the idea that we have to prove ourselves to others because we never got to see ourselves in that space before, so now we have to show we're great. 
being with my community makes it so much easier because I'm not as self-conscious about whether I'm athletic or not. I, I can ha have a good time. I can like dance out there and not be judged by a bunch of maybe homophobic people, you know? Thanks, but like we have this one night that we all get to come together and we all get to be competitive and it's a fun competitiveness. You know, we take everything we learned in school and bring it here, but in a fun, great way. It's very therapeutic to go out there and feel a sense of accomplishment for 50 minutes. We could really help change a lot of the psychosis that we as queer people feel, the loneliness we feel. We can find a little bit more, you know, family. The confidence that I have to step into uncomfortable situations now that I didn't think I could be good at and know that why not? I can just try it. I mean, heck, I wouldn't be running a business that was related to sports if I didn't find the confidence through sports to do this. I would say the future of Out Loud Sports is to continue making sure that there is accessibility in every major queer city in America. We want to create alliances with high schools to create programming where kids can start playing sports with other queer kids at younger ages. Being straight and being homosexual does not make you any different in sports. But our parents come from a different lineage of, if you're homosexual and you're in sports, you're gonna be bullied, you're gonna be attacked. To be able to start young and building confidence and strength at those ages, I think will make a huge difference in people's lives. Playing to me is my lifeblood. And that belief has kept me feeling young, kept me active, kept me vibrant, keeps me joyous, keeps me optimistic, keeps me hopeful. My God, who doesn't want that? Who wouldn't want that? And if you don't want that, it's just because you haven't tried it, really. And once you do, you're going to be like, wow, why would, I, why would I not want this at least once a week? Thank you to all the panelists. Before you go, I have one more question for you. If you had the opportunity to design a Pride Night, what would you include in it? You know, would you have giveaways? Would you have cocktails? Would there be thongs? What's the ideal Pride Night for you guys? Narnia. Narnia. I like that. Just epic frozenness. Wardrobes everywhere. Sparkles, wardrobes, just polar bears roaming. Magic. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Drag queen, umpires, and whatever sport. Espresso martinis on tap. LGBTQ youth scholarships to play sports in college. Aww. I like that. What a sweetheart. I'm a horrible event planner. I would I would hire Johnny to plan my Pride Night. See? And <laughs> make it Narnia fabulous. Pride Nights? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I love what you just said. I think that's great. Yeah. I think like including more of the community in what's being built, I think would be mm. really exciting to see. Like have a panel, like what, what, what do you want to see at our Pride event, you know, and just kind of allow for more creativity and more ideas rather than just throwing the flag out. All kidding aside, I think that Pride Night certainly needs to encourage young people to take yeah. up sports in a world where everyone just wants to be viral and everyone wants to be an influencer, to take up sports, to take up niche sports, to take up something that makes them feel proud and empowered and strong about themselves and not uh, that they can be playing on a team and they aren't alone or find their individual strength and, and roar loudly at center ice, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. I think the Pride Nights need to be more than selling rainbow t-shirts with a team logo on it and, and more about the community, the grassroots of, of the community and supporting them. Cool. I personally would like to see more trans inclusivity. I think that would be fantastic. Yeah. So that's, that's the next hurdle for me. I like it. Thank you to everyone who joined us. See you next time.